I have the honor to present Dr. Christine Jameson. She's an associate professor at the Department for Theological Studies at Concordia University here in Montreal. Her specialization is in social ethics. Her research spans issues related to bioethics and clinical ethics. In particular, she explores themes around human dignity, values conflict, and values integration. She is also currently involved in a research project on the Bible and ethics, working with a Hebrew Bible specialist. Her interest in Aboriginal spirituality grows out of her own Aboriginal roots. Her grandfather was from the Salish Nation on the West Coast interior. So for Aboriginal spirituality and ecumenical encounter, Dr. Christine Jamieson. So it's with profound respect that I acknowledge the ancestors and the people of the territorial of the traditional territory of the Mohawk Nation on which we are holding this conference. I thank them for allowing us to work within their ancestral territory. I also want to thank Adriana for uh, inviting me to be part of this conference. It's an honor, I'm, and I'm particularly glad to be here at this moment because I had this dream last night that I forgot about it. <laughs> and I looked at my clock around uh, two o'clock in the it was two o'clock in the afternoon. I thought, oh my goodness, what's Adriana going to say to me? So I'm glad, really glad to be here. I'm glad that was just a dream. Um, so as, um, as the person who introduced uh, mentioned, uh, my interest in Aboriginal spirituality stems from that, a connection with the interior Salish people of British Columbia. My grandfather was part of the Boothroyd First Nation in the Fraser Canyon area. And uh, I, you know, when I was growing up as a child, my, you know, I was aware of that connection and my father, you know, my father didn't really speak about it a lot, and it was something that I later learned that it was something that he was actually ashamed of. Um, you know, and, and he only, you know, he would only think about that part of himself in derogatory terms because of his, because when he was a child and ca growing up in Kamloops, he, he suffered a lot from being stigmatized because of that, which is not an unusual experience for uh, First Nations people in this country. Um, but later in life, my father's still alive and he's 92, and he, he sees it now as a source of huge uh, pride. Uh, he feels it very much uh, that it's a part of him that is, is of value and it's something important to him. He's more interested in it. So, and that really, you know, I think in a, in a, in a sense, my interest in Aboriginal spirituality and my father's kind of grew together. Um, it's something that I haven't spent a lot of my academic career uh, exploring, but it's something that I've been exploring in the last few years as I get older and think about more that my connection to the land. Um, it's funny because I, I grew up in a military family, and um, so we lived every three years, we were moving all over the place. But as I get older, I feel more and more connected to British Columbia. When I go out there to visit my father, I feel this connection to the land that is um, that's something that is part of, I, I recognize it more and more, that it's part of, of who I am, in a sense, part of my roots. In uh, my short presentation this morning, so I, I recognize that I, I, had, I only have about 20 minutes, and I'm, you know, hopefully we can discuss some of the issues uh, uh, in the dialogue, in the question and answer session. Uh, but in my presentation, I want to speak about two reactions to the encounter between Aboriginal spirituality and Christianity, and then to offer some reflections on these reactions in relation to ecumenical encounter. Last winter, uh, our Department of Theological Studies, uh, with the support of uh, the Roman Catholic Church and the Lutheran Church, uh, hosted a conference that we titled Beyond Dreamcatchers, Aboriginal Theology and spirituality in the Canadian context. The conference was a multi-layered event drawing together Aboriginal expression through ceremony, art, literature, media, and presentations fostering dialogue through formal questions and answers sessions and informal gatherings over breaks and meals. Those of us who carried the vision of this event 
uh, uh, who carried the vision to set this event in place were animated by a conviction that Aboriginal spirituality and theology can speak to the marginalization of religion in a secular culture. In addition, uh, there was a deep there is a deep healing and growth that needs to take place between settlers and First Nations people. So this was animated our desire to have this conference. And the conference was a huge success. It was, it was stunning, actually. We ended up having over 200 people. And it went over Friday evening and an, an all-day Saturday. And uh, it was beyond our expectations. But it also um, was, a, you know, was an indication of the interest uh, in Aboriginal spirituality and the interest uh, in you know, wanting to listen, wanting to hear. There was a lot of students that came to the, to the, to the conference and I, I recognize that some of the professors kind of forced them to come because they had assignments, but you know, they didn't just come for one session, they came for the whole, the whole thing and uh, so there was a, it was a fabulous experience. So out of that experience, um, because it was, uh, you know, the momentum was, was really there and it was really uh, prominent, um, uh, I decided to teach a course, uh, this, which I'm teaching right now, in Aboriginal spirituality. And um, so we're looking at the Aboriginal worldview. And uh, that's interesting in itself, that kind of methodology. In fact, on Monday, if any of you, this is a little plug, on Monday, if any of you are free, at noon hour, we're having a, um, an Aboriginal speaker come and the title of her talk is The Way We Know, How We Come to Know, I mean, How We Come to Know. And it's quite different. It's quite different than our sort of Western, uh, the way that we approach reality. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, so I'm kind of speaking out of this experience. And um, so, what I, as I said, what I want to do is look at um, two um, these two perspectives, these two visions, in a sense, uh, of the encounter between Aboriginal spirituality. Um, so these two reactions. So the first one uh, was one of the speakers at the conference uh, was an elder uh, whose name is Charlie Patton uh, from the Mohawk Trail Longhouse on the uh, Kanawag Kanawagi Mohawk Territory uh, on the south shore of the St. Lawrence River. Charlie spoke of his anger when he was young and, and of his journey toward peace. Uh, that he eventually came to. So he's, you know, he's an older man. He's in his 60 now, 60s now. So he, he, you know, he started out as a very angry young man and eventually was able to, through uh, going through many different Aboriginal rituals, fastings, uh, uh, et cetera, that he was able to eventually come to, come to a peace with himself. At the same time, not forgetting uh, what the elders and chiefs uh, in years past had taught him, and this is how he articulated it. The only way our people will be strong is if they will have one mind, one body, one spirit. And uh, Charlie alluded to a split. He called it a split, which he, uh, what he was talking about was he was speaking about the insertion of the European culture into traditional Aboriginal ways and the destruction that this brought. So this insertion, according to Charlie Patton, must be, re must be resisted. It must be resisted. He told the story of a Mohawk visionary, uh, who, uh, a Mohawk visionary's dream that had prophesied that when the Europeans come, they would bring five things that would destroy the Mohawk people. They would bring their black book, the Bible, they would bring their playing cards, which resulted in gam you know, the gambling, their strong water, so what he called the mind changers, alcohol and drugs, to confuse one's mind and one's sense of one's identity, their fiddle, which uh, represented for Charlie uh, their culture, and then finally their diseases, and in particular the disease of smallpox. So for, for Charlie Patton, people are either Mohawk, following the Mohawk tradition, or they are Christian, following the Christian tradition. They cannot be both. If one thinks about someone, for example, like Saint uh, Kateri Tekawitha, many Mohawks and Aboriginals in general see her as a, as a model and inspiration. 
Yet Charlie Patton, while meaning no disrespect, sees Kateri as an example of the disenfranchisement of the Mohawk people. And perhaps he would also broaden this to all the Aboriginal people. Kateri uh, gave up her Mohawk tradition and became a Catholic Christian, according to Charlie Patton. This is not a happy union, but rather the relinquishing of one's very identity. You cannot be both, according to Charlie Patton. In reflecting on this stance, it emerges from a person rooted in a tradition or an identity that is, that is under siege. Patton's effort is to safeguard his tradition and identity. He has been entrusted with it and sees it in danger of disappearing. It is important then to isolate himself and his people from those forces that would undermine his tradition, no matter how well mind, no matter how well meaning that tradition might be. Charlie Patton's perspective is rooted in part in the fragility of his culture and his people. Their identity is rooted in the land and in their language, and both of these are at risk of being lost. The second vision or the second perspective, uh, perspective comes from another, another speaker at our conference, uh, the Right Reverend Mark MacDonald, uh, an Ojibwe, of Ojibwe background and Canada's first national Indigenous Anglican bishop. So his vision comes from, a, you know, his perspective is remark markedly different than Charlie Patton's. For Mark MacDonald, the gospel message is not a foreign construct added on to Aboriginal spirituality and tradition. Rather, it is, um, it, rather it has been assimilated into Aboriginal cosmology and used in a supportive way to resist the evil that threatens Aboriginal tradition and identity. At another conference that Mark McDonald spoke, spoke of, he related the smudging ceremony, which is the ceremony of purification that, uh, that, that always happens before any event uh, that the Aboriginal people hold. Um, so he related that smudging ceremony to a passage from the book of Malachi. Uh, it's from chapter 1, verse 11, and I'll just read that passage. For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name is great among the nations, and in every place incense is offered to my name, and a pure offering, for my name is great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. So the smudging, then, is the aboriginal way of offering incense to the, cre to the God of creation. MacDonald states, and I'm quoting here, as we come closer to the culmination of history, people from every language and culture around the world will offer incense to the God of creation. So Mark MacDonald does not see the gospel as a threat, but as, a, but as part of a growing spiritual movement that he spoke of at our conference, a movement that he said is happening for all, but particularly for Aboriginal people. He expressed a profound optimism concerning Aboriginal spirituality. Aboriginal people cannot be tamed according to the European Christian framework or the European Christian vision of the gospel. They are most resistant to being assimilated into that framework, into that vision. Yet, so you have a kind of an interesting thing here. He's saying on the one hand that the Aboriginal people have assimilated the gospel into their cosmology. And on the other hand, he's saying, or, and he's also saying that, that they cannot be assimilated into a certain cultural vision of what the gospel means. And he used, um, uh, he quoted uh, the gospel of John, uh, the first chapter, one to five, and I'll just read the quote that he uh, that he read to us that day at the conference, or I don't th actually think he read it, he just gave us the, the, the chapter and the verse, but I'll read it here. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him no one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people, the light that shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. So the first chapter of John is the word that comes, a word that is light to all people. The Gospel of John uh, for Mark McDonald presents a journey of truth through creation and history that is relentless. The idea that appears in the first chapter of the Gospel of John, as McDonald explains it, is that the Creator has placed within history, within creation, a way of life that will ultimately triumph over evil. In the context of Aboriginal life and history, the evil that will be overcome is the, co- is the colonization of, the peop- of peoples. From this is born a hope that MacDonald indicates has inspired our elders and kept them strong in face of despair. For MacDonald, it is this hope that is the heart of a growing spiritual movement, a spiritual movement that he says that has very little to do with how we have understood Christian faith and Christian institutions in the past. This spiritual movement, according to MacDonald, is spiritual, not religious. He says, quote, it is the way that our elders have always lived. They have not been good at religion, but they have been very good at spirituality, end of quote. They have been They have been completely spiritual in every aspect of their lives. Even though, from the perspective of church institutions, they might not be religious. According to MacDonald, what is needed to be true to this spiritual movement is to work on being a new community, learning how to live as relatives. We have to understand anew the way in which Jesus commands us to be brothers and sisters of everyone. As MacDonald insists, Jesus' command is an artifact of Western culture um, uh, that we know so well, he says, we know it so well that we don't, we don't have to hear it anymore. We know it. We don't have to hear it anymore. But for, in reality, uh, for MacDonald, we need to listen again. We need to try to understand not what we have always heard, but what is being said. This is, and for MacDonald, this is intricately related to justice. What is very clear is that there has to be justice for Aboriginal people. There is, a, uh, quoting uh, MacDonald, there is a horrible poverty that is obscured by the richness of those who have taken end of quote. So the spiritual movement that is emerging will demand justice. So it's remarkable to note these two diverse visions, these two diverse perspectives in reaction to the encounter between Aboriginal peoples and Christianity. In my own reflection on these diverse reactions, there are just a few points I want to highlight, and I only have about five minutes, so I'll go through these. Raymond Aldred, who's also Aboriginal, oh sure, Thanks. Raymond Aldred, uh, who's um, I think from the Cree nation, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, he is from the Cree tradition, a professor of theology at Ambrose University, also a minister in, uh, evangelical, in an evangelical church in, in Calgary, speaks of, about a cultural gap that exists between different groups of people. Rather than, rather than seeing this gap as a threat, Aldred speaks of it as a place where dialogue can begin. He indicates that acknowledging the legitimacy of the other is what treaties are all about. And that's interesting, eh? I mean, in all the breaches in the treaties that have happened over the last, you know, decades. And uh, so not acknowledging the legitimacy of the other on the part of, you know, our government. Dialogue, uh, in order to um, dialogue, Sorry, um, he indicates that, so sorry, I am struck by this idea that the gap between groups, between cultures, is the very place where dialogue can happen. Dialogue in order to understand. 
not a movement to defeat or to gain dominance. The gap between Aboriginal peoples and the European settlers is a place of rich learning and could, in my view, address some of the impoverishment facing Western civilization in the 21st century. Here I'm speaking about the ecological crisis that has come about because the land and non-human beings are treated as things to be owned and used and disposed of by human beings. I am also referring to the spiritual crisis that is the result of the severing of the link with the transcendent dimension of human existence. Both crises are the fruit of a radical, secular and scientific worldview that does not recognize or respect the relational nature of all beings, including the earth, vegetation and non-human animals. The secular scientific world, with its emphasis on individual autonomy, has moved the Western world further and further away from community and relational living. The resurgence of Aboriginal spirituality, a, resurg a resurgence that remarkably has survived the onslaughts of reservations, residential schools, and the disenfranchisement of land, is emerging as a counterpoint to the path the Western world is taking, has taken, and is taking. As Aldred asserts, Canadians struggle with seeing value in Aboriginal peoples as people, as nation. We see them as individuals, as these autonomous individuals, like we think of ourselves, rather than as people, as nation. For the Aboriginal peoples, to deny one's communal, communal identity is to deny their humanity. And through a strange twist, the Western scientific and secular world is denying its own humanity when it makes the land a thing to be owned and whose resources are to be used up and depleted. As Aldred states, the land is our relative, it's our family. And it's not just the land that's our relative, all beings are our relatives, vegetation, non-human animals, spiritual beings. Aldred asserts that colonialism and neocolonialism are, quote, a focused attack on eradicating these relationships, end of quote. In Aldred's view, the West cannot do community. From that Western perspective, we cannot do community. It has lost that capacity. The West needs Aboriginal peoples. It needs Aboriginal nations to learn community. Related to that, the Western scientific secular world has lost its recognition of the transcendent, the creator, the one who sustains all life. If the loss of our community, our communal reality, has resulted in the disintegration of the environment, the loss, the loss of our spiritual self is causing the profound disintegration of a sense of meaning. Aboriginal theology is a type of contextual theology. Contextual theology takes space seriously. Unlike some traditional theology that tends to focus on time and history, Aboriginal theology focuses on God in context, in this place. This place is where the creator sustains and redeems creation. It is, the, it is in the openness of land and space where we meet the spirit of God at work in creation, incarnated. This brings me back to Mark McDonald's point and also something Aldred emphasizes in his work. Both these uh, people place an emphasis on understanding how God becomes flesh in concrete situations. Being capable of perceiving this spontaneously leads to a justice that comes out of the recognition of human and non-human suffering. Coming back to the two somewhat polar opposite visions, perspectives of the Aboriginal encounter with Christianity, the ramifications of the two approaches to dialogue strike me. One is protected and protective and isolated, the other optimistic and open. In many ways, it's easier to understand the defensive reaction of the former than to fathom the confidence of the latter. 
One might question, what is the purpose of dialogue? Is it to encounter another without the other changing us? Or is it meant to change us? Is the purpose of dialogue to encounter another, either an individual or a group, in order to be affected and changed? Allowing the other to teach me, to teach us, something about who he or she is, something about who they are, will change me. It will change us. If we think about the symbolism of the healing circle, this is precisely the power of the circle. Through encountering others in the healing circle, the victim, the perpetrator, and families and communities are brought to healing. And I'm referring to the way that Aboriginal peoples deal with crime in their community. Rather than sending these perpetrators off to this jail, cut off from community, they feel it's their responsibility to heal this person, to bring this person to healing. And it won't happen in an isolated cell. It'll only happen in the community. That's what the healing circle is all about. And I mean, this is huge, huge uh, teaching that we have to learn from, from the Aboriginal people because it really does bring about healing. There are so many examples of this. So this is really Aldred's insight when he insists that the West cannot teach itself about community. It must enter into relationship with Aboriginal peoples in order to learn community. Charlie, Stat Charlie Patton's stance of leave us alone, this is our way, we do not want to intrude on your way, so do not intrude on us, this strikes me actually as sad. I find it sad because the deep desire for encounter is denied, as is the opening of understanding between non-Aboriginal and Aboriginal people. Yet it is understandable and must be respected. Mark McDonald's approach, his willingness to encounter the other without fear of contamination, offers more hope for true ecumenical encounter, for true healing and reconciliation. Christianity needs Aboriginal spirituality. The secular scientific worldview of the Western technological world needs the Aboriginal worldview. We must promote these encounters, and we must listen attentively. Thanks. Vous croyez que euh, la réaction euh, de ce monsieur Charles, euh, Charlie Mohawk, là, euh, est attribuable au fait que euh, beaucoup d'Indiens de cette génération et même de la génération antérieure euh, ont été acculturés euh, par la suite des actions du gouvernement fédéral euh, qui les ont envoyés dans des écoles euh, où euh, on leur a inculqué de force euh, la, culture, euh, la culture occidentale et on leur a fait perdre leur propre culture. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's kind of what I meant when I said there are, there are a people under siege. Uh, there are people, it's a reactive, uh, you know, it's the need to kind of, you know, uh, kind of focus on ourselves and our identity because um, because it's under siege, because it's uh, because it has been treated in such a um, you know such a horrendous way. I mean, the, the you know I don't know if you if any of you had had a chance or have, have been involved in the truth and reconciliation um, um, talks that were happening across the country and have read anything about that. But it's um, it's just a, it's horrendous. It's horrendous what had happened to these people. You know how they. It's just it's just. I don't know what else to say. It's just, uh, it's, it, it's just a horrible, horrible thing that has happened to these people, and it's happened in the, you know, through the well-meaning of the church, of the government. You know, uh, we have to destroy the Indian and these people. You know, we have to make them become like us. I mean, that was the attitude, and uh, so yes, absolutely, it's a reaction to that, um, and um, you know, so I mean. The, you know, the, the language is so important, and so much of that's being lost, eh, their language. Uh, so Charlie, you know, he talks to his children and his grandchildren in Mohawk. 
You know, he wants them to remember the language. And there's a, there's a, a huge movement within the Aboriginal peoples to, to retain the language. I was at a beautiful uh, uh, exhibition at the Royal Museum of British Columbia in Victoria at Christmas time where they, where, they are, where they show all the different languages and you can hear the languages of all the different pe First, uh, First Nations peoples in British Columbia, all the different, uh, all the different, tri all the different nations. And, um, it's amazing, you know, and but so they want to keep that language because language is who they are. Language is their identity. Don't forget that there's a, there are people of the, of the oral tradition. Eh? They don't they don't have don't have a lot written down. So their language is who they are, and if they lose their language, they lose who they are. So these are the kinds of things that Charlie feels, you know, he needs to protect his people. You know. Uh, among Aboriginal peoples who've uh, become or remained Christian and active in one of the churches, um, what's your experience of the extent to which they would uh, identify with a particular Christian tradition? It seems that um, a lot of the emphasis put on is on bringing Indigenous spirituality into their Christian faith. And so, uh, in your experience, to what extent would they self-identify as Anglican Christians or Catholic Christians? or United Christians, and what, what might be the implications of that for, uh, or I guess another way of putting it would be, you know, what gifts can uh, the Aboriginal experience bring to the ecumenical movement? Um, well, my experience of people like Mark McDonald and Raymond Aldred and Eva Solomon and Graydon Nicholas, I'm just thinking of people that I've actually met myself, uh, you know, Graydon Nicholas and Eva Solomon are Catholic, Mark McDonald's Anglican, Raymond Aldred is evangelical. Um, they, you know, <clears throat> you know, I think what's important uh, to, to recognize is the gospel has been brought into their tradition. And what, you know, what they would say is that that didn't come with Columbus in 1492 or whatever. That was living in them, eh? There's a beautiful book by Sheil Peelman, who's an oblate, um, who, used to teach at St. Paul University in, uh, in Ottawa. I think he might be retired now, but uh, he wrote this book called Christ is an, uh, is an, an Aboriginal uh, American, or Christ is, an, uh, Christ is an, Amer um, an Aboriginal American. I think that's a Native American, sorry. Christ is a Native American. And uh, Ashil Pillman went to live with the Dene people uh, for two or three years. He learned the language, he participated in their ceremonies, and because he wanted to understand from the inside. And that's, that's the only way you can really understand the Aboriginal, their way, their, their, their tradition, is by participating in their ceremonies, being part of their communities in a sense. It's not, you can't go in a library and read about it. It just won't work um, because they are so much a people of contextualization. And, um, but this book, it's a wonderful book about how Christ, how the gospel message has been integrated into uh, the, spiritual, uh, the spirituality of the Aboriginal people. So I don't know if this is really addressing your question, but I, 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 I I don't see it as a problem for them. Now, the self-identifying as Anglican Catholic, I don't, I'm not sure I would be interested to ask people like uh, Eva and, and uh, Mark McDonald, you know, how they would relate to, you know, Catholics and Protestants and evangelicals, how they would kind of relate to each other at that level. But my sense is that, you know, that deeper level is so common to them that I don't think it would be a problem, but, but I'm not really sure about that part. But. I was, from my understanding, basically uh, the Aboriginals would promote healing or teach uh, Christianity more about healing through, uh, you know, focusing more on the earthly existence rather than focusing on the life after death and heaven. And how does that reconcile with the fact that most of the denominations, despite their differences, they, they seem to be united on, you know, focusing on the hereafter. Now, if to promote healing, we need to focus on the earthly existence, wouldn't that cause further divisions because they're already united on the heavenly goal? Hmm. It's a good question and that because uh, as I understand the Aboriginal peoples, they don't even think about it at the afterlife. It's not part of their, um, it's not part of their, um, 
you know, their, their worldview, the way they think about things. I mean, uh, God, the creator, is, lives in everything. God is, you know, with them, and, and God is, there are spirits in everything, so it's a, and I wouldn't, you know, it's not as if there isn't a relationship with God, I think, or the creator, there is a relationship, but there's also a relationship with, with everything, so it's, it really is focused on this place, this time, this space, in a sense. So I don't know, you know, it's, I don't know how d discourse about the afterlife would, you know, I don't think it would be a problem for Aboriginal people. I don't think they would have a problem if, if we wanted to talk about that, but I just don't think it preoccupies them. I know it doesn't actually, the way it preoccupies us. <laughs> My name is Sister Agnes Valderrama. I'm a Benedictine contemplative nun. And my question is, um, when you were saying that uh, the West has a lot to learn about, um, uh, what do you call this, Re rehabilitative, rehabilitative um, um, institutions yeah. um, that would work well within um, the Indian, uh, the First Nations context because they, they're within their family and so forth. But when you're talking about something on a federal level, you know, where the family is disintegrating in Quebec, um, how would you mm, suggest that the, the government uh, can um, use these means of healing that, that the uh, First Nations are successful in? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know about the present government. <laughs> But um, um, but I, I think I, one of the stories that I read, there's a community in Manitoba, just maybe a couple hundred kilometers north of, northeast of Winnipeg, called Hollow Water, Hollow Water. And it was a community that was so disintegrated, so destroyed, that it was almost dead. The people were, you know, the Aboriginal people and the Metis people that lived around there um, were addicted to alcohol, drugs, there was incest, terrible, terrible, uh, horrible kind of a pervasive uh, sexual abuse and incest going on. It was a community that was in decline. It was a community that was, um, uh, you know, just, it was just disintegrating. A few of the elders who were also themselves suffering from uh, addiction recognized some of the older, you know, women, mostly women actually in their 50s, uh, were, um, began to recognize if we don't do something, our people are going to be destroyed. So they started on a road to healing. And that healing has involved, um, first of all, themse healing themselves, and then beginning to, um, to invite those in their community to tell their stories. Nobody was talking about what was going on. And when they did invite the people to begin to tell their stories, you know who came forward to tell their stories? Children. They were the first ones, because they were the ones that were immediately being uh, suffering from sexual abuse. Eh? So they came and told. And then the, the elders would then go and speak to their parents, and then they would, their parents would get involved, and then their relatives, and eventually, and the, and the whole process was one of bringing these people together to heal. Not about the not about identifying about identifying perpetrators and sending them off to jail or isolating them from the community. That wasn't how the community is going to heal. They knew that. They knew that people had to heal within, and the community had to heal. And that's how they. And this has come hollow water. If you ever get a chance to read about it, it's a it's a beautiful example of that kind of um, you know that sort of uh, reconciliation that. Um, uh, restitution of justice that the Aboriginal peoples have to offer us, have to offer Canada, uh, you know, to understand how healing will take place. And, it's, and it will take place through community, not through isolation. And so I think that that's a huge area that I think the government and all of us have to learn from the Aboriginal peoples. But I think it has, it has ramifications at all, many, many levels, probably every level. You know, I mean, I think about, you know, the, um, 
you know, when we when I was talking about, you know, thinking of the Aboriginal people as a people, as a nation, rather than as autonomous, and that kind of that kind of cutting off of the individual autonomous human being from its community, and how that the kind of the kind of impact that's having on our on our um, you know society. You know, I mean, you know the. I mean, I, I don't want to start making wild claims, but I just feel like a lot of what's happening in our society today is the result of a kind of an isolation from, a, from community, you know, that, that young people feel, and we all feel, you know, if, we, if we're not in a community. And, and that's what, I mean, to think about, you know, their whole, their, their whole being is relational. I mean, we heard that in the two talks this morning, I think. Um, but they live that reality of that relational, relational. it's just who they are. Um, I think that's how we have so much to learn from them in terms of understanding of the importance of that at all kinds of, le at all kinds of levels. You presented one vision where uh, the salvation, in a sense, of, of Aboriginals would be to be cut off from, from society. Uh, uh, to, because if they're under siege, then they withdraw. And we have a lot of examples of religious communities that have done that. Uh, uh, we have the Amish, and we have the, the Hasidic Jews, uh, a lot of groups of that because they feel society is uh, immoral in a sense. Uh, but on, on the other hand, we, we hear about the mixing of populations. I mean, we have immigration that's come in and uh, there's a much more of a wide variety of, uh, of people. So um, there's maybe not one approach that, that's needed for Aboriginal communities. In a sense, maybe they have to uh, kind of draw back into themselves, but also expand their, their outreach to, to wider society. I don't know if you would have Yeah, that makes comments. a lot of sense. And I think that if you think about the development of children, that's what children have to do. I mean, they, they in a sense, that you know, they need to kind of be, understand who they are, and when they do that, they're able to reach out, but when they feel threatened, they go, so there's that kind of that kind of dynamic that's ongoing, I think, and I think that has to happen also. But I guess, I guess to me, what I sort of recognize is that, you know, the, you know, the, the gospel, isn't a foreign construct uh, like th like that's how I mean Charlie Patton would say it is, but certainly Mark McDonald and and Raymond Aldridge and, and Eva Solomon and Nicholas Graydon, these are people that see that that the seeds of that were already are already in their tradition, and I think that's the insight that's important for me anyway in terms of promoting ecumenical dialogue. But you're absolutely right. I think that you know I, I don't in any way. Um, uh, Criticized Charlie's position, you know. Uh, he came to speak to my class the other night, and um, and when we were driving home, he was talking about how his grandchildren were watching Tupi and Binu. I don't know if you've ever seen that show. It's a kids' show, and he's like, he's just raging about it, you know. Like, you know, they're they're just infiltrated by this, you know, culture. Eh? That's just, you know, for him, it's 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 just it's disintegrating them. So. So I, I respect that, and I understand that, and I, you know, and I think, uh, you know, uh, we're we're in a time where 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 the Aboriginal peoples continue to be, you know, subject to the onslaughts of you know broken treaties and uh, etc. So, uh, so I think they both are important. <laughs>